I'd like to introduce you to Roxy Bolton. This is Roxy Bolton. She was born in 1926 in Mississippi, but most of her life and all of her deeds would happen in Florida. Let me just share with you a few of her lifetime accomplishments so that you get a sense of who we're talking about. She invented a, invented, created a park dedicated to current and past solely female leaders, as well as a female historical gallery, both of which were the first of their kind in this country. Um, she ended uh, male-only dining establishments that were inside of um, department stores at the time. She famously said, men and women sleep together. Why can't they eat together? <laughs> she convinced President Nixon to dedicate August 26th as Women's Equality Day, which happens to be the birth date of the female vote. She convinced presidents of colleges to hire more women to department head roles and pay them equally to men. She was a staunch advocate of public breastfeeding and actually at one point was called in to rescue women from being uh, incarcerated for it. And she, in her time, flight, uh, female flight attendants were getting fired if they just turned 32, if they turned 35, if they simply got married, and if their career survived any of those, they definitely got fired for getting pregnant. And she convinced National Airlines to grant maternity leave. Um, she, let's see here. She led arguably the first march against rape with 100 people, but she inarguably did start the first rape treatment center in this country. She also got rape, the varying degrees of rape, to be defined by law so that prosecution of more offenders could take place. She started a crime watch program to protect women uh, on the streets and she created Florida's first women's shelter, open 24 hours. She created a program to help incarcerated prostitutes receive an education and stay off drugs. She fought tirelessly for the Equal Rights Amendment and finally did convince a senator to take uh, the first hearings of it before Congress in 1970. Um, by the way, it never was fully ratified by 38 states, so to this day, the U.S. Constitution does not view women as equal to men. Um, she also, at one point, was called down to an office that had just opened in Miami, and they said, Roxy, you got to come quick. The director of this office, he's, he's only hiring men, and in that respect, he's only hiring one African-American male. Now, this was especially troublesome because the office in question was the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission <laughs> itself. And she went down, she called up a girlfriend of hers who happened to be a TV personality, and they walk in and the director said, Molly Turner, what's a nice girl like you doing here with Roxy Bolton? And the whole thing was on the news that night, which Roxy rather enjoyed. <laughs> um, and so, how did this life path start? Well, when she was a child, a bridge washed out in her town, and Roxy, at the age of eight, said to herself, when I grow up, I want to be a member of Congress so that I am somebody who builds bridges. Now, I don't know about you, but when I was eight, these were my primary concerns. <laughs> so how did this gumption of hers lead to a life of actual action? Essentially, from meeting Eleanor Roosevelt when she was young. Eleanor personally told her, Roxy, never let a dead-end street stop you from where you're going. You must do the things you think you cannot do. Roxy said, many times I have felt worn down and gained strength from her words, the way she expressed it to me and the way she spoke. I have her picture, and I look at it often and remember what strength, what courage she gave me. Also, humble brag, this picture shows two of my odd salon subjects kicking ass in the real world at the same time in each other's lives. Also, Roxy Bolton's birthday was June 3rd, which happens to be Josephine Baker's birthday, which is another subject of mine, so this is all more than this nerd can handle. <laughs> now, World War II hits when Roxy's 13. We'll let her grow up for a minute. War times. Um, wiretapping is a thing, and one must assume that is a thing that's happening constantly, so one must speak in code about everything, even storms, especially storms, because you wouldn't want the enemy to think or know that we've got our hands full and when a hurricane hits, it's chaos and we're 
totally blinded and we're low on supplies and it's just awful. So we don't want the enemy to know that. So the people writing codes uh, name the storms and they name them after their girlfriends and wives. And the reason that they do this is probably because of a book. This book, which was written by a UC Berkeley professor in 1941. The cool thing about this apocalyptic fictional novel is that no character in this book has a name except the storm, which is Maria. Now, it's a, the country's obsessed with it. It's a national bestseller. And keep in mind that only 9% of households have a TV in 1950. So in 1941, bestseller means everybody read the fucking book. Everybody. And the advancement in storm prediction and technology was the dot-com of its time. I mean, yeah, we were in the space race, but space doesn't affect every single layperson the way weather does. So George Stewart was obsessed with weather technology and prediction. He wrote the book, everybody read the book, everybody's obsessed with it. So um, it, it even inspired a Broadway show, which eventually went to TV and to the movies and had a hit song, and all of it was just so much better than Cats. And pro tip, though, this is still playing at the Shattuck Theater in Berkeley, and the only people showing up to see it are super high and there to heckle. And it's actually very, very fun. It's selling out. So um, you're welcome. So it is almost certain that the military officials in charge of writing and sending those coded female named Storms had read George Stewart's book. So after the war, the newly formed Weather Bureau comes to name all hurricanes female names. Roxy's beef with that was that, quote, women deeply resent, resent being arbitrarily associated with disaster. <laughs> also, if all the weathermen are men, and they were, and all the hurricanes are female, and they were, that would allow men to use language to personify the hurricanes, demean them, even sexualize them, and the genders would never get closer to equal. Here's some of, lang of the language that reporters used at the time. Edna wept her violent meteorological tantrum for 17 hours. She was one angry woman. She was an erratic lady, if she could be called a lady. One of the worst tempered brats in an all-girl family. Shrieked like a woman in labor. Some editors remarked, the real names that we call a hurricane when it gets to town cannot be used in a family newspaper. Oh, why? Because it would make you sound unprofessional? Too late. <laughs> the language often reflected general national temperatures around gender issues at this time. This crusade took years. They sailed across the line into the 70s and battled on. She suggested that they use bird species instead, and the Weather Bureau said the Audubon Society would be after them. <laughs> so she said, you know who delights in having things named after them? Senators. <laughs> and they said, well, that would just humiliate the senators. And she said, aha, so you, you agreed that it would cause all this strife, but you don't care that it causes all this strife for women. And at that point, she usually just got an expression that you're seeing on the director of the Weather Bureau <laughs> right now. And they would always just brush her off, and often they said, we've already done all the work, you're going to have to come back next year. Assholes. Assholes. So... Um, she even, so, oh, wait, sorry. She even pushed, and this is the best part, for the word to be changed from hurricane to himicane. <laughs> now, first of all, she didn't entirely say that in all seriousness, but also you do have to realize this was the era of herstory versus history, and the first time sexism has been used in print is 1968, so it was kind of the scene. Now, at this time, the government created Project Storm Fury, which entailed seeding hurricanes as clearly diagrammed. You get a plane, you get a pilot, you tell them to fly into the eye of a hurricane, they drop a bunch of silver iodide, and that's going to change the nature of the hurricane. The hope was... <laughs> Well-funded, science. The hope was to deflate the wind power of storms, or maybe even be able to control their directions and send them to Cuba, for instance. And we thought that we could do this because America. <laughs> the results were sketchy at best and highly convenient. I don't even know how a plane flies through the outside of a hurricane to get into the inside, but apparently pilots said it was nothing compared to Vietnam. 
Here's some newspaper language around these particular efforts. The hurricane was attacked in the process of seeding and only appeared to calm down once penetrated. Highly sexualized language, especially for its time. One author I read felt that this was a way for the patriarchy to keep women on the straight and narrow after the war because they had been told to enter all of these roles that the men had had to leave and they were trained and they were very capable and they were very good and then at the end they were told to go back to the kitchen where they belonged. So this was how the patriarchy would talk about hurricanes. They would demonize them and make them bad girls to remind women that this is how we're going to talk about you if you transgress social norms. So Roxy and her National Organization of Women, or NOW, fought this issue tirelessly. At the same time, they were lobbying hard to get the Equal Rights Amendment before Congress. They sent letters, they made phone calls every day, they held meetings with public officials, they made the news, and yet they were brushed off by the men in the Weather Bureau every single time. It actually took the next generation of feminists to finish her task, as well as President Carter, who hired an unprecedented amount of women into governmental positions. He brought in Dr. Juanita Kreps, who was the first female director of the New York Stock Exchange, and made her the US Secretary of Commerce. Since that role covered the federal weather bureaus and associations, she had full authority over them and immediately demanded alternating male and female names, which Australia had been doing for five years at that point. She was told she'd have to wait until the next year, exactly the language they had repeatedly used to brush off Roxy. But Kreps said, no, I'm your boss and you'll do it now. The New York Times ran with the headline, Goodbye to Chauvinism, and the opening line was a pun, Hell hath no fury like a woman stormed. <laughs> Weathermen were mercilessly teased for finally losing to the feminists. Roxy Bolton, although not the first person to protest female named Hurricanes, there was actually one vocal man who was very against it before her, is rightly acknowledged for leading that particular crusade. Hurricane Bob joined the roster of names in 1979, nine years after Roxy had set out on her cause. Roxy said, no matter what anyone tells you, one person can make a difference, and, pr and proved it so. The former mayor of her town said of her, she was just a scrapper and a fighter her through her whole life. She was refreshing, a terror in her time. And every community needs someone like a Roxy Bolton to push back and make sure people are doing the right thing. She wasn't perfect, and I didn't go into her controversies, but she accomplished everything I've mentioned and more with only a high school degree and while raising three children. She said, my work for justice and equality will outlast any small minds. Small-minded views sadden me, but I'm not going to dwell on that. I like who I am, and I am comfortable with my journey and my approach. I'm not everybody's cup of tea, but I must have done something right to be in the Hall of Fame. Roxy passed away only recently in 2017 at the age of 90. Her epitaph has her name, the dates of her birth and death, and the word woman. Raise the glass with me to Ms. Roxy Bolton, who spent her entire life fighting for what was right, what was fair, what was always more helpful for more people, and for never giving up. Cheers, woman.